Hi, yes, uh, good evening. Welcome once again to the Gildari French Show right here in Guyana. It is August of 29, 2022, and it has been... Uh, I missed you guys last week. Uh, I was out for a little while. And Freddie, you know, I have a good friend in Freddie every day, every night, three times a day, four times a day. I saw many missed calls from him. Um, but, you know, this is a very serious show. we got to get into it right away. Today, we have with us a very distinguished gentleman, but I'm going to leave uh, the introduction to Freddie Kisun. Uh, before I start, uh, I want to say something. Uh, Freddie Kisun, the last time, uh, a couple of weeks back, Freddie Kisun bought two guavas and a knife. We had uh, the honorable member of the house, Ganesh Mahipal, was here. And Ganesh, um, I thought at one point in time there was some ulterior motives by this gentleman, Freddie Kisun. Turned out pretty um, good. We used to, started even eating during the show. Uh, but today, he has a garden filled uh, with uh, guavas in it. And today, the Honorable Minister of um, Legal Affairs, Attorney General, and Nan Lal is here, uh, bought him two guavas. And Freddie Kisun, instead of sharing with his very good friend Gildari, he decided to take it and put it and push it in his back pocket. But I'm going to hand you over right now to Freddie Kisun. Good evening. Many times on this program, Gildari would say to me, oh God, every guest come here, you teach them. <laughs> what do you think about this guest that's here? I wanted to say that, but I left, it, I left it to you. This guest was my student, and at that time, I said it in my column several times. He just stood out as a student, and I said in my column several times, I just know that guy from looking at him perform in tutorial. He was destined for legal greatness. I do believe Anil Nandalal. Anil Nandalal. A lot of people call you. I have to correct it today. The guy called me to put your name uh, advertising the program. He said, um, Anil Nandalal. And I said, Anil Nandalal. Um, AG, Attorney General, welcome to the program. I doubt whether. We could get all the questions in for an hour. We may have to go over the hour because you combine astute political analysis with brilliant um, legal touch. So we start without any delay with the first question has to be on elections because Kit Nascimento was here sitting in the same seat that you sitting and he said, just one court case away, the PNC and Mr. Granger, just one court case away stopped them from being sworn in. And you exemplify that court case and many more. So we go to what Kit Nascimento said, and then we take it from there with Ashman building. Nascimento is saying that that Mingo declaration that was done from the roof, and you said, I remember you saying, not in barbaric times people read a, a declaration from the roof. Kit Nascimento was saying that declaration was never removed. It was held in abeyance all the time, and it was one court case away from that de declaration being made legal. So, all right, so thank you very much, Gildari and Freddie, for inviting me to be part of this discussion and permit me to congratulate you two gentlemen for organizing uh, what is obviously already a very successful platform. We must encourage platforms like this because it brings together different people and allows for discussions to, to take place in our country on a multiplicity of fundamental issues. Um, so congratulations. And thank you for your very generous remarks regarding my student days. Now, <clears throat> one would recall what was happening at the time. Firstly, a, perhaps a convenient point to begin is to recognize that after election day, an election night, all the foreign observers pronounced election day activities to be peaceful, transparent, and normal, 
the proceedings in the night in terms of the checking of the ballots at the various polling stations, the transportation of the ballot boxes, the putting into the relevant documents into the ballot boxes and the necessary envelopes and their transmission to wherever they were supposed to go, all of that went smoothly. So the day after the election was incident-free. All the, dip the diplomatic community commented positively and the peaceful way the elections um, were conducted. In particular, all the political parties made public acknowledgement of the smoothness of election day activities, the fact that there were no uh, substantial complaints of irregularities. I remember David Granger, the president at the time in particular, from making pronouncements to that effect. The, attorneys, the Attorney General at the time was photographed in front of, or rather taped or videotaped in front of Ashman's building, even professing a victory for the coalition government, that everything went well and they have their uh, statements of poll and so on. It is obviously when they were checking the ballots back, then they, when they got in at a central place, the various statements of poll that would have come from the various polling stations across the country at a central place, our central place was Freedom House, Wherever their central place was, one can presume Campanama that Street. it was Campanama House Street, that they realized that they lost the elections, then all hell broke loose. Up to now, no one can explain how, and we sometimes forget these things, and we have to keep repeating these things. The, the declaration, that famous declaration that you spoke about just now, that Mingo made at the top of that building, that document has the signature of Walter Lawrence on it. A declaration by the returning officer for region number four, who is a GCOM official, independent official under the law and the constitution. Walter Lawrence played no part of the GCOM process. She's not an a commissioner at GCOM, she's not an employee at GCOM, she was not an, an employee at Ashmin Building, but her signature is there on that document. And up to now, no one can explain how that signature is there. And that signature was never denied as belonging to Walter Lawrence. So that's the first thing. Then, I mean, I can go step by step of what happened in Ashmin's building. But I want to get to the court matter because I think that's the focus of your query. So after Mingo was prepared to work and I, we had a shift system at Ashman's building. And it was my turn to take over the, 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 what you call the reconciliation or the tabulation, that's the word the law use. The tabulation of the ballots with the statements of poll with all the political parties being there, had already commenced. And obviously, instructions would have come to cause Mr. Mingo to put it on pause. Because I left there with arrangements being put in place for another shift to take over to represent the PPP's interest. And then by the time I reached from Ashman's building to Bel Air Park, where I live, I got a phone call to say, Mr. Mingo, call off the tabulation process and we'll start the next morning. The next morning, Mingo can be found. Then they rush him to the hospital after several hours of delay. They fetch him out as though he was dying and, and strap him up with all kind of medical apparatus. And that went on until you had that, that declaration. Uh, and we... You, Mingo just, nobody knew where he got that spreadsheet from. He started to read from a spreadsheet. And we had to rush to the court. Now, time was not available. We did not, we didn't get an, even an opportunity to file the documents. We went and we made an oral application to a judge to say this is what is taking place and we need an order to stop what is taking place until the court it hears an application on our behalf 
to challenge what we are asking the court to challenge. Of course, you have to be allowed a case orally. It's a very exceptional legal procedure that was employed. Perhaps, maybe one of the first time it was done in a country, at least in recent memory. And of course, that by itself was challenged as to how that was done. But of course, we had legal authorities to support us. And it was that court order that we were able to secure. And that is why the applicant name in that matter was Riaz Holadar, who was then my driver. I couldn't get even, we couldn't get the time to find a person to file the proceedings. So I, we used a person who was with me at the time, Riaz Holadar, because he was a registered elector and he's entitled to challenge if there is wrongdoing regarding the electoral process. And that is the order that we got. We had, it, we had to go and get the order entered. So you have, now have a piece of paper with, with an undertaken being given to the judge that within 48 hours, the written application will be filed for the court to have a record of it and the judge fix a returnable date. So it is that document that we took it to be served when whether she was locked up in the building or whether someone locked her up, I don't know up to now that is unclear. The chairman of the elections petition could not have been found. The election commission could not have been found to serve that document on, on, on her. And we served the other election commissioners and we obviously served Mingo. And that is the matter that began the whole legal process. That is the case that put that declaration on pause and that is how the whole um, gamut of litigation started. So that was the case, that, that was the key that opened the door, opened the door to, for us to interrogate and investigate and challenge the morbid illegalities that were taking place at Ashman Building, beginning with that Mingo's first process. Of course, he continued, though the Chief Justice, the, so the case began, and the Chief Justice took the case from the particular judge who here heard it, and we had the entire case heard by the Chief Justice, and Mingo was summoned, and all the elections commissioners were there, and the Chief Justice literally uh, demonstrated both by language and by giving examples how this tabulation must be done. She said you can project it on a screen, you can project it on a, on a computer, whatever you use, the statements of poll must be the basis upon which you tabulate the ballots. You have a copy and all the, you meaning the returning officer, and all the, preside, all the representatives of the different political parties, they have their own copies, um, and the, the observers will have their copies, so everyone tabulating at the same time. So polling station, one, two, three, four, Annandale Primary School, 200 votes, 190 for the PPP, 10 for the APNU, all of those figures ought to be consistent because you have everybody got the same statements of poll. But the statements of poll must be the basis, not a paper pulled out from somewhere with figures that no one can verify, no one can authenticate, must be the basis. That was explained in the clearest possible language to Mr. Mingo and to all the GCOM officials and the APNU officials who were present in court. Yet Mr. Mingo went back to Ashmin building and continued using that, that document, that, that, that spreadsheet, having just listened to the Chief Justice pronounced. And then when I, I went over there, I intervened and he stopped it. He then moved the location from Ashman Building now and they carried it to Kingston, a GCOM headquarters at, at, Bar at um, High Street. When we arrived there now, they, with the assistance of the police, they erected barriers beyond Lamaha Street and beyond Barak Street, curtail access, and only authorized persons can go in there. Just one representative 
or two representatives from each political party, and no one else. So observers, everyone else were put out. So they were going to complete the rigging there now. And that's when they spread this bed sheet. And, 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 and they started to project the statements of poll now. But they were doing it in such a way, such a quick way, that nobody could get to check what they were doing. So they were projecting what purports to be statements of poll on a spreadsheet, on a, on a, on a canvas. That they, I think it was a bed sheet, they call it, with a projector. But were not giving anyone sufficient time to, um, to verify or to collate the numbers properly. So they, were, they began this robotic mechanical exercise to rush the process through. When Mr. Yearwood, for example, I saw you write a lot about Mr. Yearwood. When Mr. Yearwood raised an objection, he was representing one of the political parties. Anug. Anug. He was assaulted by the APNU representative, the lady from Carol Borbis. Joseph. Carol Joseph. The man was beaten in there. And then, so, and then another declaration was made that very night. I remember Friday, the 13th of March, a declaration was made by Mingo that very night at about 11 o'clock in the night. That, that night, we worked the entire day to challenge that declaration now. At that time, COVID was at its height. They, we were informed that the high court was sprayed down with insecticides and whatever was necessary to, 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 to fumigate the place. So the high court was not in use or not available to, to be used. We, we called the necessary court officials and got a hearing arranged at Diamond Magistrates Court. Right? At Diamond Magistrates Court to have a hearing on this, this matter. That's where really, the court sat. And it was during the sitting of that hearing that we received a phone call that the CARICOM had brokered an agreement between the leader and the opposition and the president that there will be a national recount of the ballots. It was while we were arguing the case. And your friend, Mr. Vincent Alexander, he was in the court, the GCOM chairman was in the court, and all the other commissioners were in the court. And I could remember, I could, I recall distinctly the outrage on Mr. Alexander's face when he heard that President Granger and that an agreement was reached for a recount of the ballot. And I, 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 um, I said, I, I, I spoke with him in the, in the court compound. And I said, why are you so upset? I thought you would be happy as she come to have this matter resolved. He said, Politi and he, I remember his words, politicians can't bind me. We are GCOM and we have to make the decisions. And, but it, the chairperson was there and the chairperson in the high court, while that case was going on, had indicated that she would do a recount of the ballot if Mingo doesn't comply with the procedure um, pointed out by the Chief Justice, which is laid down in the Representation of the People's Act. So you had an undertaking from the chairperson, and then you had the agreement which was brokered by, by, um, at the level of CARICOM. And that is how that case was put on pause, pause until we, we, we work out now the agreement that, was, that, that, that came from the, the leader of the opposition and the president brokered by CARICOM. But that didn't end the matter. They then got Yolita Moore, a candidate of theirs, and they filed a pro proceedings in the high court to challenge that decision of Granger to go to the recount. And that matter went to the high court, the full court, and it went to the court of appeal. And we had to ventilate that entire chain of litigation before the court of appeal level, the road was cleared for the recount to go ahead. And then you had a whole set of delays with getting the recount order now negotiated. I mean, there's a whole other discussion we can, that can take you to the um, rest of the program. I know you're a, a busy man, maybe as busy as the president. Would you find time to write? You were in the thick of it. Would you have time to write a book on that? 
Well, some point in time, I, I would like somebody to record it. And if, if of course, I get the time, um, I, I would be happy to do it because I like writing. But these things must be recorded, not because, you know, I, it is because what we went through in the year 2020 as a, as a country, a democracy in the free world, what Guyana and Guyanese had to go through. And you have the very perpetrators of this travesty still complaining in the public domain that they are victims. And that's what I don't understand. They are the victims. They keep speaking about 2049 boxes that missed statutory documents. The night of the election, those boxes came from the locality of Better Hope to LBI on the east coast of the Amarara, where I have responsibility for the People's Progressive Party. My polling agents reported to us that this irregularity was taking place. I called Mr. Mingo and I said, because we had a working relationship. I, he was the returning officer of Region 4. I said, Mr. Mingo, this, your DRO, I am told, many of your DROs in this locality have instructed the, re the re relevant presiding officers to put these statutory documents in a separate envelope and not in the ballot boxes where they are supposed to go. And this is clearly wrong, and they, they have put them in this envelope, and I'm told that they are on their way to you, and they may have reached you. Mr. Mingo confirmed to me on the phone. He said that it is a mistake that they have made, the DROs, and I am in receipt of those documents. I said, please inform your CEO, Mr. Lowenfield, because I don't want this to become an issue. He said he has already done that. Now, that did not become an issue. It only became an issue at the recount now when they started to fabricate this allegation of multiple voting, dead people voting, overseas people voting, and they discovered that they could make use of this, this lack of statutory documents not being in these boxes, and they start to exploit that now as a ground. I met Lowenfield in the convention center and I said, Mr. Lowenfield, your officer, Mr. Mingo, please confirm with him because Mingo was already off the scene because of what he had done. Remember, this is post what Mingo has done. This is at the, at the convention center now. I said, please confirm that he received the documents and he told me that you are aware of it. Keith Lowenfield confirmed to me that Mr. Nandlal, I am in receipt of those statutory documents, and they are stored with GCOM, other documents, at Collingen. I went outside of the convention center where the press was assembled under a tent, and I gave an interview. The following day, Mr. Lowenfield met me in the, in the Arthur Chong Convention Center, and he said, man, if I have a conversation with you, you don't have to go and tell the press I said, Mr. Lowenfield. Yeah, I remember you, 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 yeah. you saying that I don't discuss secrets with That's you. That's correct. I said, Mr. <laughs> Keith Lowenfield, you are the chief elections officer of this country. I am representing a major stakeholder in these elections. If I discuss anything about those elections, it is not our private business. It is not confidential. It is not a secret. I am going to speak about it. It's a public issue that I'm speaking about. Thank you very much, um, AG. And on the issue, it's not a private business. Uh, repeat of the 2020 elections. What is this government doing for us not to have a repeat of that? Well, many things. So we have 32 charges already filed and are pending in the magistrate's courts. I have already expressed some reservations and critical observations about the, rate, the speed with which those cases are proceeding or the lack of speed with which they are proceeding. And the DPP, who is the constitutional agency responsible for the institution and prosecution of those charges, have been requested to raise the matter at the appropriate level with the judiciary with a view of having those cases heard and determined with the alacrity that they deserve. These are matters of national importance. The 
very constitutional structure of this country, the democratic polity of this country, the will of the people of this country, the state's apparatus and demo, um, electoral uh, machinery have been threatened, have been subverted, have been defrauded, or attempts are made to do so. The public has an interest here, the state has an interest. This is not a normal bicycle brakes case. This is where the state's apparatus, the sp state's ability to guarantee its people in democratic elections is what is under threat and what has been compromised. The state must, it, it, the state owe, its to, it, owe it to the citizens of this country to ensure that if laws are violated in this regard, the laws must be prosecuted and those found guilty must be punished in accordance with penalties stipulated by the law. So that's one set of actions that are being taken. Another set of actions concern the reforms that we are putting in place, statutory reforms. As I've often explained, the electoral process is a statutory process. It's like linked in a chain. It begins, one, with the registration of electors, and it ends with the declaration of the final results and the swearing in of a president. That is the gamut. This is the expanse of the electoral process. Every step of the way is laid down in the law. So we found that there were loopholes in the law that were exploited by, it's not really loopholes, but discretions that were abused. Law confers statutory officers who are expected to man a statutory process with certain powers, certain discretion, certain latitude in decision making. When you put perverted and corrupt personnel in those positions, the decisions can be corrupt and perverted. And that is what you had with happening at Lowenfield administered the 2011 elections the 2015 elections, 2016 elections, 2018 elections. And one can argue that he did so with reasonable competence, with no substantive or substantial outcry. But in 2020, he seemed not to have been able to understand anything in the process, wanted to determine by himself valid votes. And by determining valid votes, coincidentally, he was disenfranchising 180,000 PPP voters. I, I want to swing. Um, I hope, I hope we, we, we have to go over time because I want to get your take on political developments. Uh, I don't want to concentrate only on the elections. I want to hear your take on seminal political developments from 2015 that, will be, that researchers can use. But I want, to, I want to just stick with one question that I think is important, not the elections per se in Ashwin Building. When you take all the dimensions together, this seemed to have been a planned coup because the police were, were, were preventing elect, um, um, politicians who have a, a, a stake. Police were insulting people. One guy came here. Um, from the party, um, uh, the new movement, Dr. Joshka and I, and say police were insulting them. Now, it's one thing for GCOM to have been penetrated, but you have the police ordering um, Gifland owner to remove his cameras that were up there five years before um, the ballots were stored at Convention Center, AG. This had to be a, a conspiracy by the PNC and security forces to subvert the election? No doubt, no doubt, Mr. Kisun, the Reagan cabal had a conspiracy at work that expanded as wide and as far as was necessary for them. So you spoke about the police putting out party officials. I am going to tell you that the police put out GCOM officials out of a GCOM building. Ashman was a GCOM building. GCOM rented that building. Says Gonraj was put out of that building. Bibi Shadik was put out of that building. Robson Ben were put, were put out of that building. 
So is that political party alone, or members of political parties were put out of the building? GCOM officials themselves were put out of the building. Then you had the case where, when they started to f fabricate and concoct this ridiculous narrative of multiple voting, they then went and they, put, they submitted to the chairman of GCOM documents, a list containing persons whose names were on the list, whom they said were in New York on the date of the elections, but they, were, they voted. They said that on that list you had dead people and they voted. How legal is that, ma'am? Well, I'm, I'm going to deal with that. People came out on their own to say, look, my name is submitted in that list as being dead and I'm here. And I voted, and they're saying that I am dead. People came out from all across the country to say that I am on that list. They say that I'm in America. Look, I'm here. And I was here on election day, and I voted. <laughs> so we, and that came purportedly from the GRO, because they are the custodian of deaths, persons who die, and the records in relation there too. And that also would have come from the immigration office. So we are in the process of launching an investigation into where these documents emanated from, who gave the instructions, so that we can get to the bottom of it, because they continue to peddle these things in the, in the public domain, that dead people voted and multiple, uh, pe multiple voting took place. And you, you can have organizations who believe these narrative after a while, if you don't... Um, you know, contradict them, them yeah, yeah. right? So the, 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 the police, for example, with, with I, I spoke to that gentleman. Edgar Thomas? No, G, the, the Giftland Mall yeah, people. Oh, right. And I advised the man, Bipat, I advised him that they should not interfere with, once he is not, his camera is not focused in a way to compromise national security. What is wrong with him? Which law has he violated? AG, Edgar Thomas. Edgar Thomas was a senior superintendent of police. And somebody junior to Edgar Thomas was contradicting him. The police force was tainted in March 2020. Freddie, I want, I want, many, I want, I want many to ask. Many other agencies, um, many other state agencies would have been compromised in, in, in the process. You had, I mean, anyhow, there were many, many agencies, not only the police, you had the GROs, I've given you example, perhaps the immigration authorities. And, 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 and who was responsible for these two agencies? Immigration, GRO. Winston Felix, mm -hmm. a politician, minister, former commissioner of police. AG, so you see the connection uh, right there. AG, Freddy, I, 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 want to, I hear you. You, uh, you, uh, you. You made a statement on the premise that there's a conspiracy. There are some people who believe that everything happened in an ad hoc manner. Because if you look between March the 2nd to August the 2nd, where uh, Fernandi was sworn in as president, uh, how many cases? Do we know how many cases happened before the court? I think it's, what, it's more than a dozen. Uh, many, many, about a dozen, yes. About a dozen. And they went all Unbelievable, the way Unbelievable, ridiculous. But could it not have been an ad hoc um, kind of situation that came from a party or from a coalition that took one day at a time and let's see where this goes, let's push the envelope and see where it goes? Or is this a conspiracy from before? Well, you see, the truth, my view is that there was a decision made to rig the elections. But that decision was not allowed to be executed or, or not allowed to be executed in the manner that they had contemplated because some intervening events occurred which they did not contemplate. So. The, the, the beginning of the plan to rig the elections began with the appointment of Patterson, James Patterson, as the chairman of GCOM. That institution was supposed to have rigged the elections. It, ought to, it was going to be done by that house-to-house -house process of registration, where they would have scrapped the existing database and do a corrupt registration process where thousands of Guyanese would not have been put on that list. Mostly persons perceived to be non-APNU AFC supporters. So the election would have come and gone, and you would have a low voter turnout, but they going back into power. 
That was the general plan. So that is how they be. There is no way a government, a one-term government, would have behaved the manner that they had behaved if they depended upon popular vote to win an election. No way. So they relied solely on this plan. That plan, however, was kittled when this man was removed. That was the first thing. He was removed, and then, in the meanwhile, a no-confidence motion, which they did not anticipate, was took place. And that up overturned the apple cart, so Things to speak. Things kept spiraling out of That's control. correct. And when the no-confidence motion, they got hit, like, head like deer, deer in, with, with a, a, a car headlamp. So they didn't know where to run. And by that, and of course, that by itself brought a lot of international attention. And they're not very bright people, so they can't reason quickly. And they didn't have good, pro you know, proper advisors. So they... One step of one misstep after another started to, and the, the plan when they were dragged to the elections basically, and that's where the cases start. Mm -hmm. The attorney general of the time, for example, got a man named Compton Reed to sue him, the attorney general, to challenge the no confidence motion. He inspired the whole case. He paid using funds from the attorney general's office. Paid two lawyers out on Cold Street $25 million to file that case for Compton Reed to challenge the no confidence motion. On the basis that Sharon Das was a, a dual citizenship, dual citizen, and therefore could not have sat in the parliament, and therefore his vote was invalid, and also that 33 is not a majority of 65. AG, where did they lost the election legitimately? I think they performed, performed badly in the 2020. Corruption, uh, racial discrimination, incompetence. Where exactly did they go wrong? And they certainly went wrong. Was it 2016, the lecture of the back pay they gave themselves? Was it the sugar workers? Or was it a combination? A combination of, of many things. The thing is that when you, when, and you are a political analysis, you perhaps can do this more, more than me, better than I can. The PNC is the same old PNC. And I, I, perhaps that's the simplest way of putting it. After 20, more than 25 years in the political wilderness, one would have expected that having gotten a chance to come back again, to a coalition government, they would have learned. And things would have changed. The authoritarianism would have dissipated. And they would have at least, the problem didn't begin outwards, it began inwards. The fight started when they started to trample upon their own coalition partner. Right, the fight started there. When Moses Nagamoto was diminished to a rubber stamp after he was promised on the, on the coalition arrangement that he's going to be a prime minister with a portfolio and he would be allowed to chair cabinet, etc. Remember all those promises? That at one time he would have been given um, home affair, um, agriculture. It began right there, when Ramjetan's portfolio as home affairs minister was split in half, half given to Felix, because they didn't trust Ramjetan. They took registration, political matters, registration, citizenship, and they gave it to Felix. They gave Trotman one week a ministry, and then sometime after that, they took that away from him. And wherever they put an AFC person, they had a very, a closely a, a PNC either close by or looking over, or they split the thing. So the, this, the, it began there, and then it started to grow. grow. The other major one is the salary. You know, they, they took government in May, of, 20, of 2015, and by September, they give themselves that, that, that increase, never said it. After they denied, because there was a rumor, and some person carried a story in the news. And I remember Trotman came out denying that it happened, and then we found it in the, we found it in the official gazette, in a very small, hidden section of the Gazette, that because they had to publish a Gazette order by law to increase that salary. And that is where it was found. And it ballooned off. 
So, but then you have to look at what they did with almost every aspect of the country. So you didn't have any investments coming in. That's one. You had, you're imposing taxes, budget after budget. They impose more and more taxes. You had, they had, they created an aura of fear in this country, Freddie. And nothing destroys a country where there is fear because fear saps confidence in an economy, confidence in the people. So they use SARA, agencies like SARA, and they publicly said these things, SARA and SOKU and the GRA to start this intimidation of, and auditing people. Clive Thomas sat on television and said that they will investigate the owner of any building that is more than four story high in Georgetown. I have never heard a more ludicrous statement like that. That is what everybody in the world trying to build skyscrapers in their cities. This is a gentleman who is supposed to be an econ economist with worldwide reputation saying, and he has an investigative organization, that he will investigate any building that goes up more than four feet high. Because that by itself is evidence of money laundering in a guy in his economy. So you have, then you have what they did with the sugar industry, then what they did with the Amerindians, then what they did with people's private properties. They use the GRE. You don't know how many businessmen, they don't want to talk. You know how many businessmen were audited unlawfully and had to pay millions and millions of dollars in bribe? I am a lawyer. They, a lot of people, you know, but they don't want to discuss these things. And many other things, the policies that they were doing, the private sector businesses were closing down. They, and then what they did to their own people. One or two times I go to Buxton, Pleasance is a stone throw away. I don't think they ever visited Pleasance while they were in government. And then people are seeing, and I could show you stacks and stacks of leases and titles that they give to themselves. Is that that they did not give out? You heard me speak many, many times about hundreds of acres of lands that they gave. Lowenfield himself benefited from a hundred and something acres of rice land during when all of this taking place. And I can call all of their names. I have all the documents. AGA chief. The chief election officer. Not over a Yes. Of During that same period. Which period? During the period of the April. Yes, a hundred and something acres of land. Um, I could list the names the vice president had made many, many disclosures when we were in the leader, when we were in the opposition. When we came into government, we we named a set of people how many lands we had to take back at Ogle that they gave out. Land twenty acres of state land sold for twenty million dollars and a hundred thousand dollars collect as a purchase price and transport pass. Uh, you understand how I'm telling you? Twenty acres of land? Sold for $20 million Only and 100,000 received and transport pass. And the transport says that it is free from all encumbrances. You know what was taking place in this country? Surrealism. It was surreal. Um, so they, there was no way that an intelligent population would have given them a chance. An emergent apartheid can't, state. Can't, can't. Democracy doesn't run that uh, way. Um, AG, an emergent apartheid state. Um, is your government discriminating against afro guyanese These people don't understand, and Freddie must write a couple more articles on what apartheid is. Apartheid is a system of law that discriminates. The law says that in this zone, X, Y, and Z race can't come here. They can't own property. They can't enter here. You have laws of the country saying that, right across this land. Can I just cut you and then you're gone? I will write those articles and I will say there, is a, there has been a party, a party, and there is a party against Indians from the time they came here as indentured servants. Those people have been insulted, lambasted, violence thrust upon them. A.G., in my bone I don't have any racial blood in me. But Indians are no, um, have not been treated 
favored by the British Guyana um, uh, uh, colonial polity and post um, Burnham, Burnham sought, the Burnham government sought to dehumanize Indians. There, there has been apartheid, and there is apartheid. It's apartheid against Indians. I often, people don't like to say these things, but you live, no, through, it, the, you, you live through the Burnham era. Many housing schemes, for example, were done under Burnham government. Melanie, Roxanne Burnham Gardens, Festival City, South Ranvelt, Amelia Wards, and, and I can go on. Name one, just one Indian that benefited from one house lot or one house in one of those programs. Name one Indian. On the contrary, I can tell you of thousands of black, black Guyanese who are benefiting every single day from every single program of the People's Progressive Party. And not now, from 92 coming all the way now. I have said in an article that I wrote about that apartheid that in 2021, in the year 2021, we have given more house lots to Afro-Guyanese in Linden that they gave to the entire country in five years. You understand the statistics? The PPP government in 2021 gave more house lots to Linden, to afro Guyanese in Linden, than APNU AFC did for five years across the entire country, all races. We, we got to go over. We got you, to you go. understand what I'm telling yeah, you? We got to go over. And, I could, and I could go into every area, as I pointed out, Darren Wade. He got a scholarship from this government this year to go study law in England, and he claims that he's a victim of apartheid. <laughs> These guys are a pack of lunatics, a pack of crazy people. They, um, they This man, David Hines, I saw him sitting here. He has a conceptual problem with an Indian woman selling black pudding. And he got a pro He is speaking about apartheid. These people, have, something is mentally wrong with them. Mentally wrong. Henry Jeffrey, as I pointed out in an article, sat in four successive government, PPP government as a minister. He didn't know that the PPP was an apartheid government. Yeah, okay. When he enjoyed all the benefits. I'm writing about that. I'm right? writing about that. Um, and each one of them I can go through there. Every one of them that spoke there. Um, AG, AG, you, you, have, you have jurisdiction over this. You are, you meaning the state, are going to continue to fund it part of the G. And, it, and this body has no representative of black people in other organizations like in the PPP, like in the trade union. This seemed to be a PNC Vincent Alexander outfit. First of all, I know of no other privately owned company, and I stress that, no other privately owned company that benefits from such largesse at the level of the state, $500 million. Mr. Vincent Alexander can speak from now till thy kingdom come. The incorporation documents show that it's a limited liability, privately owned company by the shareholders listed, of which I believe he's one. They are listed as the beneficial owners. I don't know any other private company that gets that kind of public funding. And what are they doing with, and they are not, you heard them, their explanation? about what they are doing, with five, what they have done with $500 million? Call it half a billion. It's so half a cool. billion. That's a lot of money. Freddie wants Half a there. billion. Um, I, am go I am going to confront him and accost him now. How you could give that money, man? Look, I, I need a, a car. You need a car, <laughs> not a car? What <laughs> cars do you want to land? So, uh, <laughs> so and, and, and I, I, they had a press conference, which I had the opportunity of looking at, trying to understand. And I could tell you, I did a, a program where I listed what they, what they said, how the money was spent. How were they constituted? Why, why aren't African Guyanese in the PPP? Why are they not in, in, in the body that administers 
the state. But that is the it. Five no, minutes nobody, is nobody knows how that organization was formed, how they arrived at the leadership, how they had elections. Nobody knew. How, how, how did mis how does this grouping become um, this thing? How? I don't know how. Did, was Sam Hines invited? Was, was um, Adam Harris invited? I don't know. Nobody knows. And well, they say that they represent 60 organizations. And that's the same question that the Rastafarian Council is asking. How did you arrive at this, this collection and only of three, leadership? Only three persons can sign the bank, the checks, and they're all from one organization, Coffee 250, founded by Vincent Alexander and um, David Hines. AG. There is no... Let me just make the okay. last point. In, in, in the context of this allegation of a... What do you call it? Apartheid, apartheid. state? Yeah. The name, emerging apartheid yeah. state. Name any other private limited liability company of an ethnic type that receives anywhere close to a fraction of that sum of money from the state. But before Gildari come in, are you still going to the state still going to give them that money for 2022, 2023? I am I'm not sure. That is the, the debate is still um, out in the public domain. But certainly, based upon what I heard them say, they organized a market day in Mocha, Arcadia. They didn't build a market. They organized a market day. And in, and in trying to explain what and what they did with 500 million, half a billion dollars, they list that as a significant event. You hear what I'm telling you, Freddie Kisun? They, or, they didn't build the market, you know. They organized a market day. In other words, they went in the village and they tell everybody, you come out here and you all sell. And to, from you all do this every week. That's how you understand a market day is organized. I don't know how much money that will cost. But that was listed among one of the significant accomplishments of this organization by the organizations themselves in their public attempts to explain away their expenditure. AG, voters list. We're supposed to be holding local government elections later this year. The opposition leader has spoken over the voters list being bloated, among other things. Let's talk about pitfalls. Well, we, and, uh, we have been saying repeatedly that there is no bloated list. And once they understand that the list and how the list is compiled, how people names go on that list and how people names are removed from that list is all a matter of law, then they will understand that the concept of a bloated list in relation to the Guyana list does not exist. It's a figment of their imagination and it's political propaganda. So people qualify to go on that list and to qualify you have to be a Guyanese you have to be 18 years and over and a Guyanese. That, that, that's the two qualifications. Once, and then you go on that list. You can only come off on that list now if you suffer a disqualification. Because you didn't go there automatically, you go there by a qualification. Now there are, there are disqualifications that cause you to be removed. If you are dead, obviously. If you're a bankrupt, there's another ground. Residency is not a requirement under our law to be on that list or to be off that list. You can be resident in Timbuktu, but once you're 18 years and you're a Guyanese, you are entitled to be registered. And once you are registered, your name cannot come off that list unless you, sat you are disqualified by one of the grounds stated in the law. They don't have to accept my word or the PVP word on that. The Chief Justice of the country ruled. GCOM, to its credit, recently issued a very elaborate statement quoting the relevant portions of the Chief Justice's ruling. GCOM has made the fundamental point that claims and objections are one of the mechanisms that allows any person to go and clean, clean a bloated list. So rather than Norton keep saying the list is bloated, now is the time. Claims and objections are currently ongoing. Let him go to GCOM 
and justify how he will clean the list. Now he has the chance. The law is now giving him a chance. That's the, what the process allows him to do. If he has 50,000 or 100,000 extra people, now he can make the objections. That's why the thing is called claims. Is to put people name who are not there but who should be there. So you make a claim. If you now, the other part of the process is an objection. Claims an objection. If you want to raise an objection, he has an objection apparently. He says the list is bloated by tens of thousands. Well, then let him go to GCOM or to any one of the GCOM offices and comply with the procedure to remove the tens of thousands of the persons who he feels should not be on the list. A it's as simple as that. AG, could I ask you to take off your legal hat and put on your political hat? I believe there are people out there who want to hear your analysis of, of political issues unrelated to the election. Um, when you were growing up in Annandale, I, I believe you had some admiration for the then one of the big leaders in the, the PPP, Moses Nagamutu. How can someone like Moses Nagamutu, who put up the line, Clive Thomas from that legacy of the 70s, so ignominiously destroy himself? I don't know, Freddie. You're right. I grew up with these people. I, in a speech in Parliament, I believe one budget time, or I can't remember what was the event, but I recall standing on the public road in the vicinity of Annandale, Monrepo area, in 1980, when Walter Rodney was killed. And there was a march from Buxton to Georgetown. In that march, there were Rupert Rupnarine, Clive Thomas, um, and I, the whole group, Bonita Harris, Takuma Ogunsi, the whole group of them. Perhaps David Hines was there, but I, he was not known. Clive Thomas was there, and so on. The whole leadership of the WP. And you know what the chant was? Who kill Rodney? Burnham kill Rodney. Those at the front were, were shouting, Who kill Rodney? And they shouted at the back, Burnham kill Rodney. Moses Bagwan was there. All of them were chanting that. Who kill Rodney? Burnham kill Rodney. Walking from Buxton to Georgetown. And those are the very people who had no qualms in stopping. You forgot, the... to, mention, you forgot to mention UC Kwayana. UC Kwayana, yes. You had to UC Kwayana. And those are the people who had no qualms in sitting in Barnum's party. After, uh, after he, after they stopped his commission of inquiry, stopped the commission of inquiry. But fortunately, the Commission of Inquiry concluded, had enough evidence to conclude. So, Moses... You got to talk about Moses, yeah. What Moses Nagamutu. To... Moses Nagamutu, I, I, I don't know. We, you grew up in the PPP, and this was a man, he was very fluent, very charismatic in his speaking, always speak about revolution, and he was a revolutionary, and... Che Guevara and name his children after these revolutionary people and so on. And then you realize that I don't know how it ended in such ignominy. I, I don't know. It's really hard to explain. And where is he now? I don't even see him anymore. Yeah, I'm hoping last year you saw Mr. David Green, the former president. I've never seen him since... I, 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 I haven't seen him in the past year, three years. Do, there is a theory years. going along. There's a TV going, I'm not going to call you AG, I'm going to call you um, Mr. Mandral. There's a, because you're wearing your political hat. There's a theory going around, I've heard it, that um, he was backing away from the vulgarities, but they were just forcing him and Who's abusing him, him David Granger. Okay. You, you ever heard about that theory? I, they, they were at some there were so many um, vacillations that, that were taking place. And at some point in time, I, I did get the sense that there were persons who were forcing him to do the unthinkable. So Lincoln Lewis, Hamilton Green, 
They both said, I remember, they saying that David Granger would be acting in the best interest of this country if he were to ignore the results of the election, ignore the international observers, ignore and continue in government and repudiate the election results. Don't accept them. They felt some way in their sadistic minds or sadistic manner of reasoning, they felt that there was some moral justification. In fact, they justified it that way. They said that history will absolve him for doing such, and not what I consider to be an unthinkable thing. In the night we used to, I used to write post, Facebook post on these statements because I used to come out at all hours in the night during that six months period, five months period, and you had to answer them sometimes, individually or collectively as a political party. So yes, at various time during that process, the pendulum was swinging and, 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 um, you know, after his, well, well, you know, the son-in-law came out with some statements and so on. So you see that there were different pulls. There were pushes and pulls and so on taking place. But certainly, there is a rabid, you call them the, the lunatic fringe. I think that's what you call them. You did L that? You said <laughs> lunatic fringe. fringe. LF. Yeah. That's what you are yeah, yeah, yeah. TLF. So there is the, T <laughs> the TLF. The, the, the fellas in New York, in the basements operating these radio um, stations. Burke and Venture. Right, and then you have the other TLFs mm -hmm. here who are stoking that kind of fire. So you have these people around and they were pushing in that direction. And I, I don't know what would have resulted if the country had to go in that direction. Where would, have, where would we have been today? Ramjatan and the Russians, you want to talk about that? Look at Ramjatan. <laughs> A respectable lawyer. I, I can't understand how these guys can say these things. Ramjatan, you can remember, went to his office and bid his staff yeah, goodbye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did deliver a farewell speech. Watch a minute, I come to this. Right? And he said in those spe in that speech, he said he knows that he still has some friends in the PPP. He said they regard him as big brother. They regard I'm him as big you brother. Know. Do you regard I, him I as believe big I may be one, fortunately, you know. you fortunately or unfortunately, brother. I may have been one that he was making But we actually, you know, is he your big but, brother? <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> I, I have a younger brother. I am the big one. But, um, but, but there is this guy, and he's saying this, and he's thanking everybody for their services and so on, and that the declaration will be made this afternoon. And then the following day, he goes on Fazil Mohammed radio Trinidad, show in Trinidad and denies that, that he ever delivered a farewell speech. He said he was bidding farewell to the staff because he was on his way to the prime ministership. And these guys expect you to take them seriously? How, how can you take people like that seriously? Have you heard, up to now I see the videos still circulating, as they attempt, in, a very, in very sophisticated ways and fashions, to justify how 33 is not a majority of 65. Have you heard the various pieces? Nagamoto tried to Nagamoto. talk about some rum bottle, mm -hmm. and Nigel Hughes in this very sophisticated British accent trying to explain that 33, and then Ramjatan breaking into Creolese. You had <laughs> various expose of the Guyanese dialect at work, right? <laughs> From the sophisticated to the crass, trying to explain how 33 um, is not and cannot be a majority of 65. And these are educated people who are saying so. Educated people. AG, back to your um, AG hat. AG, when you entered office in 2020, um, uh, sworn in short as the Attorney General, a significant case uh, was filed uh, against uh, what we call the scam, the pyramid scheme. I think it was um, the matters before the court right now, billions of dollars. Um, early in this program, you said uh, uh, or you decried uh, the slot uh, in, in, in the process, the court process, how it's working. Uh, they say justice delayed is justice denied. What progress has this government made? 
with regards to cleaning up the court process, improving it, and take it up to a level where we want it. Every day, different initiatives are being pursued that are intended to bring speed to both the criminal justice system and um, the civil justice system. The judiciary, as you know, is independent. They get their budget, they submit their budget to the Ministry of Finance, and they get bulk, um, um, bulk approval, and they spend in accordance with that budget. So it's an independent body. Government has very little to do, rather than work, ensure that their the institution is resourced, and they get lands, etc., to ensure that courts are built, etc. But outside of that, the government has very little uh, control. Well, we have no control over the judiciary. We should not have any control over the judiciary. But at the same time, the executive is responsible to the people of Guyana for the expenditure of public funds. So though an independent agency is spending it, the executive is held responsible. We have to account to the people of Guyana because we collect their taxes. The executive function is to raise finance. One of the ma main methods of raising finance, to finance public services, is through taxation. So we are held constitutionally responsible and politically responsible for mon expenditure of monies that are spent by other agencies over, which, over whom we don't have really con functional control. But that is the nature of the system. But that is why those agencies have a public duty to ensure that their agency functions with this transparency, transparently, accountably, and competently, and that they deliver the type of services that they should deliver, that a reasonably competent entity of like that should deliver to the people of any country. The Ponzi scheme, though, Hundreds of charges have been filed, and they are in the court system. It, it's, this is a very unfortunate matter, and this is something perhaps you can do some investigative journalism on, because this guy is said to have collected so much money, and the, it, the banking system of the country does not show that the money left Guyana. The immigration authorities don't show, or the custom authorities don't show, that the money left Guyana. And I'm not talking about ordinary money, millions of US dollars, and the money disappears. The man owns nothing in the country. He owns not a house, not a vehicle. He's here, but the money is gone, and thousands of people have been defrauded. This also did not happen while we were in government. But the people are holding the government responsible. How can the government be responsible for you being defrauded your money? You are going to give your money to Freddie Kisun. You're not signing any paper, or if he signs a paper, it's not worth anything. You're not going to consult a lawyer. You go on and do business. Freddie run away with the money. It's a crime, but how can a government be blamed? Many times I'm asked these questions on Facebook, what the government is. There's nothing that a government can do. First of all, the government was not told that you are going to invest your money in, uh, with this gentleman, whoever he is. We were not even in the government. I remember we were in the opposition, and I, we used to hear about this thing. And we warned people. But apparently, the, the thing had some very attractive um, terms. And some people may have benefited at some point in time to cause such a large number of persons to find the thing attractive. Um, I want to, I know you, I know you wanted a chief libel lawyers in the Caribbean, so I don't know how you're going to answer this. Mm -hmm. But I saw you in Parliament, and you said to two members of the opposition, you said to one of them, why don't you pay your water bill? And you said to another one, light bill. Light bill. And you said to another one, shut up, you are with, you never sober. Who are those two persons? <laughs> <laughs> who, are the, who don't pay the light bill and who's never It so was a, a parliamentarian who is no longer there. He was, these guys... You don't pay, he didn't pay... No, GPL caught. Uh, and went and, to and, his, and who's, uh, the, who's the guy who's never sober? <laughs> 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 all right, all right. All right. But, but to answer your question, the, the principle is, 
that you cannot be sued for what you say in the parliament. You have that no, no. privilege. Now, because you have that privilege, you are expected to behave in a particular manner. So, but those, those on the other side, they want that privilege, and then they don't want to behave in the manner that the privilege requires them to behave. So they want to enjoy immunity and yet sue the parliament too. We, our type of elections is quite simple. What, according to Ramjitan, how would the Russians have rigged this election? I don't know. You should get Ramjatan. <laughs> Erasers and pencil. Or what? I don't know what Ramjatan meant when he said that the Russians are here. And I, I'm, he would come here and he would ju try to justify it. That is what I don't understand with these guys. Man. The elections have come and gone. I would want, if I were him, I would want that phase of my life to be erased quietly so that nobody don't remember. But these guys keep repeating it as though they want, is like they, they, they claim to fame. So Ramjatan might be very proud of what he said about the Russians. The bat um, protests, uh, the bat protests, and the killing of those boys. Have we been able to make any progress with that? How are we making out? Persons were shot and persons were charged. I am aware that a preliminary inquiry, or more than one, are ongoing at Fort Wellington Magistrates Court. I have been. The family, the families have been speaking to me. Again, they are complaining about delay. Um, but I told them that, that the system has to work. No, no, nobody can instruct the magistrate what to do. So they, they have to wait until the magistrate is ready to rule. So they have been speaking with me um, on that matter. They were complaining the other day about uh, um, uh, a photocopying machine not working, um, so they were not getting paid. The court was not um, being able to photocopy some documents. I drew it to the attention of the Registrar of the Supreme Court, and hopefully that matter may have been rectified. The hemp law was recently passed, and then, of course, big debate over the ganja uh, liberalization or decriminalization of it. Have we made any progress in that regard? Where are we? The hemp law has been passed. Um, the Minister of Agriculture, who is the subject minister under the law, is in the process of constituting the governing structure. You know, it's, it's a highly regulatory industry. And because of the nature of the product, the plant, because it's so closely related to cannabis or marijuana, you have to have this heavy presence in, in, in the regulatory network of it. So there are there is a licensing authority, there is a board, etc., that have to be appointed. That is being done as I speak. The, the Narcotics Amendment Act bill that has completed its um, sojourn in the Special Select Committee and it's ready to be taken back to the Parliament um, when Parliament resumes in October, um, custodial sentence will be removed from um, small quantities. I think it's 15 grams and 30 grams. And in one case, you get fine, and in one, the other case, you get counseling. Right? Uh, but you don't get imprisonment. I, I want to take you back to uh, elections. Um, many of the guests that were here... Um, that were involved in the Ashman thing. They said, Conrad said sometimes you leave at one o'clock in the morning, you come back at five o'clock, you have to walk up to the street to get your car. Was, was there any time um, that the collective leadership of the PPP felt that uh, um, the physical harm would come to them as they leave? You had to go home to have baths, you had to go home to eat. No. We we were receiving information that it was not safe, that X is being planned, Y is being planned to harm you. Um, yeah, we received that type of information. We, you know, precautionary steps were were taken. So, yes, we did I receive. I think it's true to say... In we period, did receive information. I think it's true to say in that period because 
the emphasis was on the court case because everything hinges. If Goinja and the PNC was to go back in government, it had to be the court cases. Mm. And therefore, at that time, as an analyst, you were the face of the PPP. I think one has to be naive not to think. The PPP leaders were doing their work, appealing to people, but the court cases was what brought it to an end. And at that time, you were the face of the PPP. Was there, did you get any intelligence that they felt that that main man should be removed? My, my political party, as a collective, we received information. And steps were, 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 were put in place to ensure that, you know, those who were under threat, just in, we were not in government. There was not much that you could have done in any event. So, but yes, we, we, threats were received, intelligence were received, and appropriate actions were, were taken to be as safe as possible. That's all you can, you can hope for. What else can you do? Coming back as, as the AG, um, uh, could you say, sir, there's been, uh, over the years, a lot of um, criticisms of the office of the DPP and the performance and maybe some powers of the DPP. I think there was a recent court uh, ruling at the Caribbean Court of Justice with regard to some uh, liberties, I think it is, that she would have taken. I'm using some wide mm. words here. And you said that will be corrected. Mm -hmm. she, Could you give us a, so, what's so, happening here? So the DPP, as you know, is an independent constitutional office that is responsible for the prosecution of cases, the institution of charges, the legal advisor to the state in criminal matters. Um, the DPP has some wide powers. Some were struck down, or one aspect of those powers was struck down by the Caribbean Court of Justice in the Bisram case. That is a power that was conventionally and historically vested in the DPP, and we inherited this from England, vested in the DPP to direct a magistrate at a preliminary inquiry to open, reopen a case, let us say the magistrate discharges the accused, is to order, direct the magistrate, rearrest the accused, direct the magistrate to reopen and commit. That power, where a, judici where a judicial officer is being given direction on how to pronounce on a case, a matter that is ought to be exclusively within the domain of that judicial officer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was found to be unconstitutional and in dire conflict with the separation of powers doctrine. Though, as I said, that has been part of our law for decades, but the CCG it found... It started on the Burnham, Mr. Marcelin Bacchus <laughs> from Barbies told me Burnham... Well, it, um, it, 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 to be fair to Mr. Burnham, we inherited that as part of our legal system from England. Those were always the laws that we inherited as a country, and it cut off in 1966. So all these British statutes we received. You see, England doesn't have a written constitution. But when we got it, and our constitution really says that pre-existing constitutional law, meaning that laws that existed prior to the constitution, even if, it is, if they are inconsistent with the constitution, they will not be void for inconsistency. But laws passed ex post facto the Constitution will be void for inconsistency if they are inconsistent with the Constitution. You understand? Yeah. So pre-independent laws were saved. This was a pre-independent statute. But the CCJ has broken down that barrier. They are saying that's how they decide the matter in the cross-dressing case. The, the cross-dressing matter was a pre-existing law too. And that is why no court before ever struck it down. But they removed that barrier. They destroyed that pre-existing law argument. Who is the past leader in the world that you admire? Jerry Jagan is one. Um, Jawaharlal Nehru is another one. Man Nelson Mandela. Um, uh, I like Ronald Reagan, actually. Okay. Like Ronald um, Reagan too. Who you think? Who's your 
in your estimation, is the most brilliant lawyer Guyana produced? You coming up shortly to join that category. We, we produced that. We produced many, many brilliant lawyers. Among them, it, it's difficult to name. Jay Wolfen stopped the list. Jay Wolfen is among among the top. Dr. Mohammed Shahabuddin certainly is there. J.O.F. Haynes is there. Fred Wills is there, but maybe Fred didn't write, so you, you don't have evidence. Sir Lionel Laku is there. Sir Lionel Laku. Do not say. Do there. not. You have um, Fenton Ramsahoy. We had, we had Shahabuddin a, didn't do any justice with no, the well, that, Constitution. Shahabuddin, because of his politics, you know, he may be. You know, that's, that's why he's not... Sh but if you look at his law, his stint at the World Court, Shahabuddin wrote the constitutional history of Guyana, highly academic, no other uh, historical account of our constitutional evolution from the 18th century. He did that. He wrote a book called The Legal System of Guyana. How a brilliant nothing, man nothing could like frame that. such a constitution. Then... To give Bonham that kind of then power. Then he wrote a series of articles. Then he went to the World Court of Justice where he um, he has rendered the most written judgments in the World Court of Justice than any other judge in the history of that court. A.G., his son has posted a book to me. I never know the man, I never know his son. A pictorial history mm -hmm. of Dr. Shahabuddin. I'd like to pass it on to you if you don't have it. I have it. They, oh, they sent okay. one to me too. Okay. So um, Fenton also wrote a book, The Land Law of Guyana, an excellent dissertation of our land law, a very difficult area. So you have these academic, and then Fenton distinguished himself in practice right across the Caribbean for a number of years. He was the only Caribbean lawyer who used to go to the Privy Council. That's that distinction. Geoff Haynes wrote some of the most scintillating judgments ever written in this hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a good solid breed of, of lawyers over the years. Somebody's asking from abroad if there's any contemplation from this government to maybe open the way for overseas Guyanese who may be working and living abroad to uh, to vote from over there. But they can't, they, I mean, vote from overseas? Yes, you live in New York. You're we are so like born in Pax. Yeah, yeah we, 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 are, we have, Guyana has had a better experience is with overseas voting. And um, I don't, uh, th that is what I will say. Right now, the law does not permit it. If the person wishes, they have to travel to Guyana. But um, that system was abused, as Freddie said. That was a system used to rig the 1968 elections. And after there was this huge outcry after they made that video, and there's a video out there, you can get it on YouTube here, Thousands of people in London at the burial ground and the cemetery and so on voted. Thousands of people voted who, who, were, who were dead and not Guyanese and so on. <laughs> and then now they, these people are talking about fictitious voting. You could you believe that? So, and, and so that was a platform that they used to rig the 1968 elections. 90, and after there was a huge public outcry, that was minimized a little or reduced, uh, significantly rather. But then in 1973, the rigging mechanism became the army. So the army was used in 1973 because they couldn't do the overseas, they couldn't rig as massively as they did in 1968 by the overseas voting. So they used the army to remove the ballots from the polling station, take them to Camp Ghana, empty the ballots and stuff their own marked X's there. Freddie was in the National Service during that time? Yeah. Well, I, I don't understand. Why would someone like you, you've always, and I've written this, you come across as very concerned about the poor and powerless. There's no question about that. I've known you personally mm. for over 30 years. Why would you like Ronald Reagan? No, no. I, I like a sense of humor, actually. It's a sense of humor I was, I was referring to. Oh, now that Freddie has gotten that question out of the way, I know you were burning to ask it. I want to ask you, A.G., you were uh, one of the main uh, contenders against Irfan Ali for the presidential candidate uh, two, two years back. Is that passion still in you? Um, uh, we are coming up elections 2025. It's scheduled for then, let's say 2030 again. Is yeah. Adnan Lal going to be in the, the ring again with that? 
No, no, the, the party will determine the candidacy. Most likely to, it will be the president continuing for his second term. I don't think um, anyone is in doubt about that. My passion is for service. It's, it's here. It will be here for a long time. And, um, and I'm committed to that. I, I like that. I've dedicated this part of my life towards that. And that's why I am where I am and doing what I'm doing. I enjoy doing this. This is not work. This is, you know, part of my very existence now. Is your government doing enough as of now to wind to second term? Certainly. Um, though I will say that it may be a little arrogant for one to say that we are doing enough because there is so much more to do and there is so much more we would like to do. But um, I think that it is very difficult to do more than we are actually doing having regard to all the circumstances at play. You open the newspaper at any given day and you see five, six ministers out in the fields, photographs alone. And, and I don't know how many maybe you don't, maybe you don't see. Every single day, there is a, our ministers are out there. Every day we are trying to get new policies off the ground, trying to make the life of every Guyanese better. The president just spent a weekend in Region 9, the deep recesses of, um, of, 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 of Southern Guyana, and touched a lot of people. While that was going on, another set of minister was in, ministers were in the Upper North, Region 1, where they had an um, expo and so on. And then you, had, you, you, you would have saw, seen Ashley Singh in Region 2, you would have seen Zulfikar Mustafa in Region 6. I was in East Bank, as a with Colin Kroll. So, at any given day, and that's just, I just gave you there last weekend. And we do that every single day. And, um, and, and we, we stick to our manifesto promises. And hopefully we will be able to deliver on those promises. Um, we have completed two years in office, and I believe that we have done well in that two years. Perhaps we could have done more. We had a lot of setbacks. We had COVID. We had astronomical um, prices in the world market. You have a, a major war to deal with between global producers of food and fuel. You have, um, you got now monkeypox to deal with. So you have a the weather phenomenon, of course. So there have been challenges. Other countries, every country in the world, reeling from these the consequences that flow from this. And we are no different. But we have been able to um, unfold for the people of Guyana a number of packages. People are calling it handouts. They are critical of it. But we have been able to, in our, to, to curb the, the e impacts of the rise in cost of living. Um, we have never denied that this thing is taking place. The, the cost of living has risen, has arisen tremendously. And we have outlined a menu of measures and, and we are implementing them. The President went and announced a whole set of grants, 30,000 grants per child across the country, grants for farmers, grants for fishermen, grants for low-lying areas, all kinds of um, cash uh, packages have been handed out. Um, sugar workers who were not paid were given a, um, a bonus and, 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 and across the country. Thank you very much for that, uh, Attorney General Anil Nandal. Freddie, in closing, we were well, really I, I, I thought um, people may feel interpreted as a joke about the guava. But um, the AG did bring two big guavas yeah, well, from you the street. It. I didn't and I any. wanted to bring it on the show to show that um, you know people should support their local. Look what grows on the Attorney General tree. Something far better than um He's a passionate apple. guy. No, um, I'm not one to flatter people. That's not been my tradition. But you've always been one of my favorite politicians. And I wish you the very, very best in the future. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kisun. Thank you, Gerdari. It has been a pleasure. And let's do this again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, um, I forgot. What about the grant for interviewers from the state? Uh, grants, <laughs> grants giving out over the place. What?
What did you say? I don't mind the grant. That's why the Kisuna is not a waste of an opportunity to um, uh, uh, corner the minister, ambush the minister. But it has been lovely talking to um, Attorney General, Minister of Legal Affairs, Anand Anlal. Of course, we got to raise those questions with him. I would have loved to ask many more, including the stake uh, of the oil. So, ladies and gentlemen, as always, as we close, we want to say, please take your time on the roadways. Please protect your life, uh, the lives of others. And people's properties as well. And it's good to be back. And with Freddie Kisun, my very selfish friend. Have a pleasant rest of the night until Wednesday. See you again. Same place, same time.